We've just come back from a wonderful time connecting with 412, which is our apostolic um, group that we're part of, connecting with the guys from South Africa. And I felt like God was really preparing the church while we were there. It was much time about preparation and actually taking us really deep into the things of God. And there was some amazing teaching, which I'm sure will come here at some point around all sorts of subjects that actually we've never really touched on before. And so it was, for me, it, it was a deeply impacting time. And it wasn't so much a rah-rah time, but it was a shaping. And it feels like God is doing something with his church at the moment, which is about preparation. It's about setting our hearts right for what is to come. And there are many things in the church that are going to help us to be strong. But this morning I just want to conclude the Word for the Day series with just one thing where I really feel we need as individuals and collectively to make ourselves strong if we are to survive what is to come and position ourselves well. But the first thing I thought might be interesting is, oh, I've lost all my uh, arrows. There were a load of arrows on that, uh, that map um, before. But anyway, the reason I was showing this map was because, incredibly, when we were at 412, there were churches there from Zambia, from Brazil, from Russia, from Switzerland, or connected to Switzerland, the UK, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and the center of the universe, the Isle of Man. And it was just such an amazing thing. It's, isn't it amazing to think that here we are living on this island, which is 30 miles long and 13 miles wide, and we're connecting with nations from all over the world, from South America, from Africa, from Europe, from every part of the planet. The gospel is reaching the nations. And we, in this small little island, are right in the hub of it. And it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. I exciting. Do you know, once I was walking home from work and I prayed a prayer. Just, this was a few years ago. A gentle prayer, just as I was walking along. I said, Lord, it would be really fantastic one day if people from around the globe came to the Isle of Man to see what you were doing here. And then I realized at the conference this year, looking out at all these nations, that actually it had happened. The dream that we'd held in our hearts that the nations were going to come and see what God was doing here had been fulfilled. And God was doing something here of significance. But if we are to see the fulfillment of that, we are actually going to have to not stop. We're going to have to be tireless in our pursuit of what God is doing. Because sometimes the wave of the Spirit can land and then move on. So we want to, in the words of Rick Warren, ride the wave while it's here and really pursue and press into God. So we've just had a great preach from James last week on works and faith and how that connects. And I believe Lucas preached a great word on uh, being a man. I see all our men looking a bit more manly now. That's good. And I'm going to conclude this series, which is really just about things that are on our heart, with a word for today, which is about stealing the secret place. And it's about something that I believe the enemy is forming as an attack against us. So hold on to your hats. You know, Proverbs 10.25 says, Disaster strikes like a cyclone, and the wicked are whirled away, but the good man has a strong anchor. So when the storm comes, the good man has a strong anchor and is left standing. And certain things are going to give us that strong anchor. So the first thing I want to share with you is, do you know we have an enemy? We do have an enemy. I'm sorry, but we do have an enemy. And Satan is the enemy of the saints. It says in Revelation 12 verse 10, For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. That's going to be the ultimate fate for Satan. But for now... He who accuses them before our God day and night. Day and night, Satan is accusing you and me before God. Actually, Satan hates you. And he hates me. And it's 
You know, sometimes I think um, people have this kind of soft view of Satan dressed in a, a red costume with a tail and a silly fork like that guy that follows the Tour de France. But no, actually, Satan is a powerful being. And Satan's desire, his desire is to be worshipped. He wants to be worshipped. He will do anything to draw worship away from God and onto him. In fact, he even tried to tempt Jesus, the Son of God, this way, didn't he? The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So he was even trying to tempt the very Son of God with power and authority because it belongs to him. Satan is the God of this age, and he's the ruler of this world, it says in John 12, 31. Albeit it's temporary. You know, his ultimate destiny has been sealed by Jesus' victory on the cross. But in this time... His methods are subtle. It's all about deceit and lies. Jesus actually said to the Jews when they refused to accept him as being sent by the Father, he said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, Satan's primary method of attacking the church and attacking us is through disguise and counterfeit. It's through disguising something as good that is in fact meant for evil. Listen to this. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he warns them of false apostles. This is in 2 Corinthians 11 11, um, 13 to 15. False apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. So disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He makes himself look like something that is of Christ. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So how can you tackle this? Well, Jesus is the good shepherd, isn't he? And how do we recognize the good shepherd? What does the Bible say? By his voice. We had a prophetic word, didn't we, this morning about being tuned in. You have to be able to recognize the voice of the shepherd. Jesus says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. And the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, Jesus' purpose is life. Satan's purpose is death. And we have to learn to recognize his voice if we are to avoid deception. I heard this wonderful story while I was in South Africa. One of our, our friends, and one of uh, the leaders of one of the Josh Jen congregations. Just excuse me a moment. And he was talking about his son. And his son was stood on the top of this cliff. And it was a waterfall. And he wanted to jump into the waterfall. But he was too scared. Actually, Carol and I did this when we were in South Africa. We stood on this rock and jumped into this freezing cold rock pool. And uh, it was scary. I only did it because she did it and I didn't want to look like a wimp. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to say, when we were said, I'll do it again, I couldn't. (laughs) But this boy was stood here on the edge of the rock and he wanted to jump into the waterfall, but he couldn't. He was too scared. So he said to his dad, who was behind him, Dad, I want you to push me. I'm only going to do this if you push me. Now, imagine if you're a father of a son that has learnt to trust you so much that he's willing to say, I'll do this, you push me, Dad. He knew his father so well. 
He trusted his father so well. He recognized everything in his father that was good to the point that he was willing to entrust his well-being into his father's hands. Even though he was unsure of what was going to happen down at the bottom, he knew that his dad would not do something to him that was going to harm him. And that's how familiar we need to become with Jesus. Because Jesus said in John 10 verse 4 to 5, When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And listen to this but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Our protection here is familiarity with the voice of Jesus. So where is deception and stealing of this voice coming in in today's society? Well, I want to look at a prophecy that Daniel had in Daniel 8. And this actually speaks of immediate days, this prophecy, and the immediate days have actually been fulfilled. This was a prophecy about Alexander the Great, the Greek, and how Alexander's empire was going to raise up. Daniel's vision describes him as a goat, and it's going to raise up and it was going to smash the Persian empire, which is described as a ram. And everything in this prophecy actually was fulfilled. It all happened. Alexander's kingdom rose up as the Greeks and it smashed the Persian Empire. So in the immediate days, this prophecy has been fulfilled. But with everything about the prophetic, it also speaks of future days. And it speaks of the days to come. And it speaks of today. And, and actually in John, 2 John 1, John writes of antichrists. So people who are going to deceive and come against the work of the gospel. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. So this prophecy of Daniel actually speaks of deception today. So let's just have a look at it. Daniel 8, starting at verse 5. And I'm just going to read between 5 and 12. Um, not the whole thing, but we'll, we'll just um, jump about a little bit. And so Daniel says... As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west. So a vision of a goat crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. And out of one of them, this is out of one of the goat's horns, came another horn which started small but grew in power. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. And it took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord, and his sanctuary was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. So this beast raised up, swept across the whole of the the globe from the west, And it stole the daily sacrifices of the people of God. And the sanctuary was thrown down. And as a result of the daily sacrifice being stolen, the truth was thrown down. Make sense? See, the the daily sacrifice, the um, giving up to God of what we should be doing daily was stolen by this beast. Now, I believe that there is an attack here on the daily sacrifice and the sanctuary even today. So what is it? Well, what is the daily sacrifice in our walk with God? What is it? Time with him. The sanctuary has become the secret place where we are the temple, actually. We have become the temple of the presence of God, of the Holy Spirit. And so the sanctuary has become our daily sacrifice with God. Our time with him. Our time with the truth. The truth is the word of God. So the sanctuary and the daily sacrifice has become the time that we personally give to God. Does that make sense? You see that? Good. You see, we are set apart. We are consecrated. So consecrated actually means, in in the Old Testament, it's a a Hebrew phrase meaning miliharda. It means with full hands, completely full hands. So we're completely 100% set apart for God. So we are a sacrifice, and we must give all that we are to him. We had 
um, some prophetic words today about how a, even a little bit of interference can stop us from fully experiencing the fullness of God. You see, there's a subtle eroding of this daily sacrifice going on today. Because in that verse, in John 10 verse 10, the word steal is the Greek kleptes. And what it means is, it's the root of the word kleptomaniac. As in, you know, someone who steals. And actually what it means is a stealth-like manner of robbery. So it's a a creeping up and stealing. <laughs> a, bit, <laughs> a bit like Lucas now, aren't I? <laughs> it, it's, it's a stealth-like robbery. It's not an over, oh, here I am to steal your daily sacrifice. It's, it's a stealth-like robbery. It's a sneaking up. It's a creeping up. It's a grabbing when you're not looking. So how is this happening today? Well, let me give you a few statistics about Facebook. <laughs> Do you know there are 1.49 billion users of Facebook today? In a month. 1.49 billion users in, in a month. The average usage of Facebook per day globally, we'll get to the UK in a minute because it's a lot worse in the UK, is 20 minutes a day. So I did some maths. Please, nobody test me on my maths. <laughs> and actually, that means that every day, 38,000 years are spent on Facebook. 38,000 years a day is spent on Facebook. Now, let's look a bit wider at media usage then. For the U if, if this is the UK. So the average daily use of the internet via a PC or one of these things, my favorite position in the world, <laughs> my iPad, is three hours and 59 minutes. So basically four hours a day. Average daily use of the internet via one of these things is one hour 52 minutes. And average daily use of social media, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, face twit, twit face, Whatever else you use. Katie's not here, is she? Chat on, chat on. That's something I installed and no one else in the world uses. But <laughs> <laughs> so I was posting away on chat on and not a single person was seeing anything I said. <laughs> Two hours and 13 minutes a day. Average daily watching of TV. Three hours and five minutes. Well, um, if you take an average lifetime, that's nine years watching television. And th some research has been done by Victory Church in the States. What do you think the average amount of time a Christian prays per day is? Three to seven minutes. Three to seven minutes. You see, the problem is we're subtly losing contact with the voice of the Father. We're subtly losing contact with the very thing that's going to protect us from deception, from being caught out by the enemy's strategies. I, <laughs> I learned something. Have you ever seen in a restaurant when you see a couple eating a meal together and they're both on their phones? So they're sitting opposite each other, but just completely ignoring each other because they're on their phones. It happens all the time. You see it all the time. Apparently, it's called fubbing. Did you make that up? No, my sister will do. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a combination of phone and snubbing, fubbing. But we're, we're losing, subtly losing contact with what we need to protect us. Now, let me ask a challenging question here. Please don't answer this for fear of embarrassment. I wonder how many people, if I said to you, for a week, I'll take away your phone or your Bible, which would you miss most? Let's be honest. <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the thing about pointing fingers is 
three fingers point back. So three fingers are pointing back at me, don't worry. And I can only preach this sermon because Carol's not here today. (laughs) But you know, it's interesting because I believe a lot of people would miss their phone a lot more than they would miss their Bible. Now, hear me right here, folks. Phones, Facebook, I'm not saying they are wrong in themselves. So, you know, actually Facebook can be a wonderful thing. So hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that these things are inherently wrong. They're they're not wrong. But they are stealing from our daily sacrifice. Because I wonder how many of us, when we first get up in the morning, what's the first thing we turn to? Do we first open the Bible and read the Word of God? Or do we switch on our phone? You know, I really think, guys, that put your phone outside your secret place. Put your iPad outside your secret place. Get yourself a paper Bible. I'm a bit of a Luddite here. (laughs) Because if you're in a secret place with God and the only thing you've got is your paper Bible, you're not tempted to to see what the latest posting is, is, are you? You know, this is the strength of our relationship with God, is our spiritual health at all costs. I read a story of Corrie Ten Boom. You know Corrie Ten Boom? Who was interned in the Nazi concentration camps, the, the hiding place. Her and her sister were being marched into this new concentration camp, Ravensbrook. Ravensbrook. And she hid her Bible in a pouch around her neck. And when they were being, when they were, being marched forward. They were being searched and they were told to to strip down and give everything up. Her sister, in front of her, faked diarrhea. She said, oh, I've I've got, and she she risked being shot, actually. She bent over and said, oh, I've got diarrhea. And the guard said, get her out of here. Get into the shower room. And so they ran into the shower room and they hid her Bible behind this wooden bench which was crawling with cockroaches because she would rather lose her blanket than her Bible. And she said the most amazing thing. Listen to this. When a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. When he stops studying the Bible, the devil laughs. When he stops praying, the devil shouts for joy. Is that, isn't that profound? Isn't that profound? I just think that's so deep for us today. Um, So I'm going to give you three quick things as to what we can do. How we can be strongly positioned to resist. So James 4 verse 7 says, this is the message version. Um, It's just a verse there saying, do not give the devil away to defeat you. But listen to this. So let God work his will in you. Yell aloud, no, to the devil. And watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God. And he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom. And cry your eyes out. Fun and games are over. Get serious. Really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. How do we do this? How do we strengthen ourselves This is not rocket science, church. It really isn't. Because God promises not to allow temptation beyond what we can bear. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. So there's a way out here. Protect what is being stolen. Protect the sanctuary of your personal space with God. The secret place. Tune in to the voice of the Good Shepherd. Recognize his voice and don't follow a stranger. And the first thing we need to do is we we need to pray. Prayer. The enemy tries to steal our time, interest and love. But Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. It's really one of the shortest verses in the Bible. It just says, Pray continually. Pray unceasingly. Never stop praying. Never allow the subtle kleptomaniac 
to steal prayer away from you. I love Jesus' teaching on prayer in Matthew 6. If, if you want to understand about prayer, read Matthew 6. But listen to this in verse 6. He says, But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. I love that. I love the fact that the Father sees it when you go into your secret place. And actually, the, the Greek underneath this is a word, tamion, which it refers to the storeroom of the, and, and the treasury in the Hebrew homes because it was the only room in the house that had a door on it. So actually, Jesus was saying, pray in the only room in the house that has a door on it so that your Father can see what's going on in secret and others can't see. And there, he's going to reward you. He's actually going to reward you. We miss that bit often. And sometimes we say we're too busy. I'm talking myself into conviction here. I'm just like, oh Lord. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I was where you were. (laughs) No, it's not about condemnation. You know, actually, this is about what is going to protect us and what God loves in us. And it's easy to talk ourselves out of this. But actually, it's what Jesus was recommending to us to protect ourselves. Do you know John Wesley's mother, Susanna? Cross your legs, ladies. She had 19 children, (laughs) of which only 10 survived, actually. And do you know what she did? She committed to spend an hour a day with every child. That's 10 hours. An hour a day with every individual child. And they lived in pretty much a one-room house. But she was so passionate about her secret place and praying and making sure that she didn't miss her daily sacrifice that she told the kids that this is my apron. When my apron goes over my head, I'm praying. You don't disturb me. So there she was, sat in the middle of this room with 10 kids, sat on the chair, She put her apron over her head and that was her secret place because she knew that was the thing that was most important to the health of her children. And out of her children came John Wesley and Charles Wesley, probably two of the greatest evangelists the Christian church has ever seen. See, Jesus is our pattern here. He often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. He taught us how to pray in Matthew 6, the disciples' prayer. Now, practically speaking, I want you to understand that Jesus taught that it wasn't lengthy babbling. So we're busy. We have busy lives. But we can establish a simple daily pattern in our lives. That means we might have to get up 15 minutes earlier. I've had to set my alarm for half an hour earlier. Sometimes we've just got to have to actually get a little bit of discipline in order to get the secret place into our daily sacrifice every day. And in 15 minutes, you can pray up a storm, believe me. Just think about ACTS, the acronym ACTS. Adoration, adore God. Confession, keep a short account with God. Thanksgiving, thank God for what he's done. And supplication, which is just a posh religious word meaning ask for things. You know, you can just create a nice pattern in your day where you just go to your secret place where there's a door and you can close it and you can just be with the Lord just for those 15 minutes and I guarantee it's going to set you up strong for the day. And I confess, you know, I'm confessing before you that I used to talk about prayer on the go. You know, oh, I I pray as I go along the day. You know, when I'm in the office, I pray. And, And that's nothing wrong with that. But if it's an excuse for not getting proper time with the Lord, it is exactly that. It's an excuse. You know, Jesus, over 20 times in the New Testament, not just Jesus, but we're commanded to ask. Over 20 times in the New Testament, we're commanded to ask. That's ask, seek, knock. E.M. Bounds, who wrote nine books on prayer out of 11 books, he said this, Nothing is well done without prayer for the simple reason that it leaves God out of the account. Satan has effectively disarmed us when he can keep us too busy doing things to stop and pray. On, on here, 
I keep a prayer list. And uh, I've started, you know, I've started to practice what I'm preaching a little bit. I've got a long way to go. But I looked, I counted on my prayer list the other day. I've got 59 answered prayers written on my prayer list. Because if we don't ask, we don't get. James said that, didn't he? He wrote that. Okay, so pray. Second thing, the word of God. When it's stolen, it's so that it's when it's not read with purpose. So if the only time we're ever in the word of God is listening to the preach on Sunday, then it's being stolen from us. And the enemy's tactic is to occupy us with activity, turning to our phone first. But the word of God is spiritual food. It's nourishment for health. It's like vitamin C protecting against illness. It's inoculation. Jesus said it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you know in Ephesians 6, the armor of God, there's only one aspect of the armor which is an offensive weapon. The rest are defensive. It's armor. And the only offensive weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So if you want to go on the attack, you need the Word of God. And it's keeping us fit for the fight. It's an offensive weapon. So find a reading plan. We can help you if you need a reading plan. Or start the Bible in a year. Or just start at the beginning and read. And you know what? I'd rather, rather read the Bible than books about the Bible. If, if, if you're time-pressed, read the Bible, not books about the Bible. And there's nothing wrong with books about the Bible if you've got the time. But if you're missing out on the Word of God, you're missing out on spiritual nourishment. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. When should we stop reading the Bible in our quiet time? When God has spoken to us. And the more we get familiar with the voice of the shepherd, the quicker that's going to happen. In the secret place, God will speak. Because Jesus said, he will reward you there. And then thirdly and lastly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love this message version of Ephesians 5 verse 18. Don't drink too much wine, that cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge drafts of Him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God. The Father in the name of our Master, Jesus Christ. You know, when we worship, we're replacing what's being stolen with what is good. Instead of drinking songs, worship the Lord. You know, if you've got music on and you've got short time, why not have worship music? There's nothing wrong with music, you know, but some of the lyrics are disguised as masquerading of light. And actually, it's just a masquerade. It's actually deceitful. Because the Holy Spirit in our lives, Jesus said, John 14, 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. He's the reminder. Ryan Kingsley, who's one of the pastors in South Africa, he said when he was here, every day I get down on my knees and I ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit because it's the only way I can get through the day. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Let's take back the secret place. Let's take back the daily sacrifices. You know, it's funny, isn't it, that that beast swept from the West. Well, where is most of these things coming from? The West. (laughs) You know, I want us to be a healthy church. I want to be a healthy Christian. And it's in the daily sacrifices that we're really going to find that health. I don't know if Lee maybe can just come and play for a moment, but... Perhaps I could ask us to just close our eyes for a minute. (coughs) There is a warning here, but there is also the joy of a way out. 
Now, I believe God is calling us to protect the joy, the discipline, and the strength of our daily sacrifice in the sanctuary. And some of us this morning have probably felt the Holy Spirit pinpoint some stuff in our lives. Well, it's just a call back from the Father to come and sit at his feet. When the demon-possessed man was cleared of the demons, the people came back to find out what was going on and they found him sitting at Jesus' feet. And that's where we need to be, sitting at Jesus' feet. So I'm going to ask you now, do you need to rededicate your secret place? Do you need to rededicate your daily sacrifice? You know, have you realized that the subtle stealing of your time with God every day has meant that it's perfunctory or it's box ticking, but it's not really ministering to Jesus? And he's calling you back to the secret place then I'd like to ask you to stand where you are. Be bold. Let's have every eye closed. Um, And let's make a a call before God to say, do you know what? I'm going to rededicate my secret place, my daily sacrifice. I'm going to commit to sacrificing daily to you, Lord, to reading your word, to spending time in prayer. I know I've let it slip. Forgive me, Lord, but I want to be at your feet, Jesus. Let's just be bold. You know, it's just a commitment between you and the Lord that you know time has stolen something from you. It's great. You know, it's just a, we're just going to be bold now and make a commitment. Say, Lord, would you come and help me? Is there anyone else? You know, I, I really sense this is a word for the church if we are to stand strong. You know, and we're going to just pray together. Wonderful. Thank you so much for those standing. Let's just open our hands where you stood, just, just as an open commitment to the Lord. I'd love to pray for us. I'd love to pray for us. Father, I want to thank you that you promised to reward us in the secret place when we go into that place of communion with you, Lord, your promise is to reward us. And Father, we just want to ask you to forgive us that we've just taken it for granted. Lord, we want to ask you to forgive us that we haven't made it the priority that it is and subtly it's been stolen or tarnished. But Lord, this morning we thank you that your heart is not to condemn but your heart is to love. Thank you for every person stood here, every hand raised in open palm to you, Lord. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is available to us, and I pray now you would fill us by your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Father, I pray you would fill us with such a love for your word that the shepherd's voice would be so familiar to us that every deceit would be exposed so easily because we know your voice. And we're familiar with the shepherd's voice. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are the good shepherd, the one who intends good for us. Protect your church, Lord God, from the attack of the enemy. Make us a strong people. So, Lord, would you fill us now in Jesus' name. And I just pray that each person committing now, Lord God, you would give them the strength to take an action, a specific action, to make this happen. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.